uh, towards dinner and everything. Thank uh, you. Again, just, yo, yeah, you're welcome. Again, just uh, if you could mute, um, I'll take questions at the end via the chat function. If you, you want to, you know, like Catherine said, if you want to chat during. Richard, you're muted. That's odd. Okay. No, it's my fault. I muted everybody. And okay. I got yeah, everything. Okay. So real quick, because I think some of it got in. Uh, yeah. If you could just keep your audio off, but uh, please feel free to show yourselves because it's really nice to see an audience. Um, and thank you. I was just complimenting Catherine because I know she's worked a long day. And thank, uh, thanks to Rye for having me. What I'm going to be doing is you're going to be seeing very little of me, lucky you. Um, I'm just going to be here at the intro. I'm going to be showing you largely images. And at the end, I'm going to show you a clip from our award-winning documentary, uh, Gatsby in Connecticut. By the way, that was uh, The New Yorker, voted that number 30 of the top 36 films um, of 2020. And I'm talking about all films and documentaries. So we're, ver we're very, very proud of that. I'm in Westport, Connecticut. It's my first webinar, my first Zoom when it's still light out. So I'm a little disoriented, but it's, it's also really, really, really nice. And I grew up here and I'll be telling that story because it's very much part of this story. But I wanted to start off on a historical note that I hope you guys will find interesting. Obviously, uh, Captain said I was a uh, history teacher forever and I'm a historian. Um, in 1920, when Scott and Zelda were here, they were facing three identical challenges, as all Americans were. One, a global pandemic. The only safeguard for that was a mask. And not to make light of COVID, I don't have to tell you that, but that killed 50 million people. So number one, a pandemic. Number two, the worst race riots in American history, 37 cities since the Civil War and Reconstruction at a time when Black lives did not matter. And number three, although it's been surprisingly resilient, the worst depression uh, until they didn't even have, you know, they called it the Great Depression then um, because the Great Depression hadn't happened. So again, I, I love that to kind of frame this story because of course, as they say, history repeats itself. So I'm gonna transition three times during this presentation, okay? Um, I'll be gonna share a screen, then I'll be stopping, sharing, stopping, sharing, okay? So please uh, hang with me uh, with those. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna start with the book he wrote before Gatsby, and you'll see why, all right? This is, the, this is my book, obviously, uh, you know, uh, a shameless uh, book promo that I have to show you. And um, that's them in front of their house in Westport. I'm gonna be showing you that, it still exists today. And the reason I call it Boats Against the Current and one of the um, things that I hope you can take away from this is when I started this journey 42 years, 45 years ago, right, I was 14 years old. And I tried to further that Westport was important. I was laughed at. And it took seven years of going against the current, by the way, that's also the last line of The Great Gatsby. It's in the last sentence. So, you know, it's got a double uh, purpose there. But about halfway through this, I talked to the leading Fitzgerald academic who said, Deej, that's my nickname. I'll just use that for now. Long story, don't ask, it's embarrassing. But uh, he said, Deej, if you get Westport in the top 25 places that were important to the Fitzgeralds, uh, it's a noble and it's a completely lost cause. So my job today is to show you that, you know, don't give up. By the way, all of us have a book. I, I, I still like to say I'm not a writer. I just wrote a book. Um, and like Scott Fitzgerald said, all my characters are Scott Fitzgerald. I think you all have a book in you and I think you should go ahead and write it. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Uh, not only did I find that Westport was not in the top 25, I found out that it was actually, and Zoom, of course, is, it was actually number one. Um, and all I had to do to figure this out was read everything that they wrote and read everything they wrote about them. That sounds like a big chore. It was delightful. And there it was. 
there it was. It popped up like almost invisible ink between the pages. Scott writes The Beautiful and Damned. Most of it's written in Westport. Most of it takes place in Westport, the town of Marietta in the novel. It's completely autobiographical. Um, and as Charles Scribner said, and I'll be talking about him, it's the dry run for The Great Gatsby. Zelda Fitzgerald in Save Me the Waltz writes about the same time period, the honeymoon period, which is what the characters do in The Beautiful and Damned, in her only novel, in her only play. She reverses the premise of, uh, in Scandalabra, she reverses the premise of um, The Beautiful and Damned. It's in five of Scott's short stories, and in one of the best short stories ever written, Cruise of the Rolling Junk, and I, I highly recommend that. All right, and of course, we'll be talking about Gatsby. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna do some bad teaching in the beginning. We're gonna move really, really fast because I know you wanna get to Gatsby, okay? And um, I think you're gonna enjoy this, most people do. Okay, here they are. Uh, that is their, after they got uh, married in St. Patrick's Cathedral in April of 1920. She's 19, Scott's 24. So what I want you to kind of think about is their, their youth. They were strikingly youthful. Um, she's a college student that then went to college. Uh, Scott's a grad student that didn't go to grad school and failed out of Princeton. But that's how young they were when they were here. Now, they did a, a signal thing. They got kicked out of the city of New York. Now, I'm trying to find other people who have done that in history, and I just can't quote, maybe the British in the uh, American Revolution, but uh, other than that, they got kicked out of the two leading hotels, the Commodore and the Biltmore. The last straw was when they abused a brand new invention. This was called the revolving door. And what they did was they revolved for 30 minutes in this door. Nobody could get in and out of the hotel. So they said, get out of here. They buy a secondhand Marmon and they drive. They're going up to Lake Champlain in Vermont. But on the way, Scott finds out from a friend that it's too cold to swim there. And he says, famously, if Zelda can't swim, she's miserable. So they literally blindly take a right off the post road and they end up in a town that will influence them more than any other place they live. Okay, here's his book, The Beautiful and Damned. Um, uh, a lot of it is about this newlywed couple living in a house in the town of Marietta, which is Westport, and it's completely autobiographical. What I love about what Scott said about the cover of this was he said, you know, the artist did a pretty good job with the girl, but that's a pretty debauched version of myself. So uh, I love it. And by the way, they were only here for five months. That's the average of where they lived uh, throughout their entire lives. They never owned property. They were always renters. Um, and keep in mind the idea of Great Neck being the setting for the Great Gatsby. And it has a huge influence. So I'm not denying Great Neck at all. Matter of fact, what I like to say is that Westport and Great Neck are uh, a beachy blend of um, uh, together that, that help uh, make Gatsby. Um, all right, and again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk while you read, which is not good teaching, but you'll understand, I'll give you more time to read stuff when we get to Gatsby. So Marion is Westport again, and what they do is they rent this pre-colonial house, um, as it's described there, Paul Revere and all that stuff. Uh, it was from the Gray family, group of farmers, it was color gray back then. It is gray today. And um, it was called the gray house uh, uh, in the novel. Um, and what you see is the porch he's referring to is on the left there. There's a very famous photo of them taken there. Uh, the one on the uh, right was an add-on and there's been an add-on in the back, but the entire house is perfectly intact from uh, when they lived there. And I lead very popular tours in Westport. I'll be talking about that later. You guys might want to uh, join us on a summer day. Okay, this is overwhelming. Uh, as long as I can give you a flavor of what you're about to see, this must look like a giant salad to you. But what it is, it's a Google Earth image where I tracked the action of a particular scene in the novel, which comes straight out of their real life. And what I'm gonna be showing you is just partial sequences. Um, because when I read The Beautiful and Damned at the age of 14, I was stunned to read a virtual roadmap of Westport. Characters are taking a left here, they're taking a right here. They're um, you know, going around a traffic circle here. And I was following a roadmap. I thought I discovered this amazing thing, but then somebody invented the internet 
I found out that was very, very, very uh, common knowledge. But then um, when I read Gatsby at 16, two years later, I said, is Westport here? And I kind of put a couple of things together, but not fully. And I'll talk to you about how I was able to, and that was because of the great Barbara Probe Solomon. So again, I'm gonna move fast here just to give you the flavor. Okay, bottom right where this yellow pin is here. Here's the Fitzgerald house. This is where Scott and Zelda live. This is where Anthony and Gloria Patch live, all right, in, in the story. So when I say Gloria, it's Zelda. When I say Anthony, it's Scott, because they did the exact same thing and Scott just recorded it. So I'm gonna be showing you, Zelda runs out of the house, Scott's in hot pursuit, takes a left down this road, goes all the way here to the train bridge and pops over to the Westport train bridge. All right, so let me just break that down for you. Um, what happened was they would have parties that would start Thursday night. And the house rules, house rules were that you had to be out by Sunday night. But remember, he's 24 and she was 19. So they would start Thursday night and they would end Wednesday morning. And on and on and on it went, okay? So one of these parties, this big hulking Princeton classmate of Scott begins to ha hit on Zelda, <laughs> not uncommon. Uh, most men found her completely irresistible. And in terror and very drunk, she flees the party. And this is what Gloria does. So here's just the description. She rounds a house and starts on the front path down the road. It's still there. Everything you see is obviously still there. And everything I'm gonna show you is only partial to the other landmarks and descriptions. Um, sure enough, just up the road was a red barn. My wife and I almost bought it uh, this summer. It's a beautifully reconditioned uh, barn. And at that time, indeed, um, and there's my bike in the bottom left-hand corner. Indeed, at that time, it was the only house between where they lived on the corner of a mystery millionaire's estate of 175 acres and the town of Westport. So there we go. And then she turns the fork and she goes down East Ferry Lane again. And I'm just giving you partial descriptions to give you an idea. The moon comes out, you know, as she's running. Scott writes about this, okay? And I'll give you a second to read this. This is critically important. Wow, there it is. He is test driving the single most important color in the history of American fiction, the green light, the entire symbol of the American dream. I'm sure you read Gatsby. It's the central motif of the novel. And he's already using it here five years before. And as Charles Scribner, who is the grandson of the Scribners, Scribner Publishing House, uh, that published Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and Thomas Wolfe said that uh, it's the dry run for The Great Gatsby in more ways than this, uh, you know, but I can only show you this for now. And I just love them. Those towers are still there, and I love how he uh, describes it, the giant spider. Um, she crosses the bridge, still there today. By the way, in The Beautiful and Damned, it's described as a yard wide. Yes, I'm a nut job. I measured it. It's three feet wide to this day. And once you get down halfway and you take a look to your right, there is the town of Westport slash Marietta. Now, keep in mind that Westport didn't have 95 there then, um, and it was deforested because it was an agrarian community. Um, uh, so the, this, the town would have been very visible there. You can only see part of it there, straight from their lives. Uh, she gets to the train station. The, the station house is still there. And what I love uh, is that they climbed on the roof of this um, station house many times after pulling an all-nighter, and they would wait for the first train to New York City, which was, was the 5.33 out of Westport. By the way, it took 70, seven zero minutes to get to New York. You are lucky today if it's that short of, of a ride. So, uh, you know, the infrastructure was even better. So, excuse me while I transition. I'll be right back with you. Um, I'm going to transition to the Gatsby bit. All right. Again, um, I'll also show you why I'm, I'm showing you this. This, by the way, this is um, 
truly, and, and, and again, if you read the reviews on Amazon, you know, I'm not making this up. This is a very popular book. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it is as much a um, coffee table book as anything else. You'll see images here you've never seen before and you'll never see again. Why? Uh, a lot of it is uh, just pictures I found, but a lot of them are from the Fitzgerald estate who granted me special dispensation to be able to show them. Uh, they believed in my mission. Uh, and I've always believed this. I said this to my film partner. I think that if you have a mission that's pure of heart, uh, you'll always win. And by the way, if you want to make a million dollars writing a book, spend three million. Uh, uh, but you know what? Happy to. Happy to. Um, and so this is a limited edition of 2,500 copies. And I mean, after that, there won't be any more. It's not a sales pitch. I cannot produce any more. So um, pick it up. Uh, I think you'll love it. Just as most people say they love it. And I ask, well, so what did you think? They're like, ah, I kind of just looked at the pictures, but uh, that's okay too. Okay, here they are uh, when they're married. Okay, stunningly handsome. They were America's first pop stars before Babe Ruth, right? With the explosion of the radio and media. These are America's first pop stars. Um, they were incandescent, covered breathlessly by the national uh, press. But this was the, the article that changed my life. It's from 1996, it's from Barbara Probe Solomon, who just passed away, but was thrilled that we were able to validate her story. And um, I'll be talking about that in just a second. You can actually get it online. It's, I believe, September 1996. Uh, it's called Westport Wildlife, as uh, you can see. Now, Barbara grew, grew up across from the mystery millionaire Effie Lewis that I'll be talking about shortly. Literally across. Yes, her family was immensely wealthy. I'll be talking about that. And um, they had the longest dock in the vicinity. And yes, it had a green light. And it even had a lighthouse on their property. Um, here's the, what happened with Barbara. And here's kind of like... I think the main lesson, what I learned, her idea that Westport was a, a big contribution, uh, you know, a, along with Great Neck, but even bigger. Uh, and by the way, the head of the Great Neck Historical Society said, um, she, we've got her on film, she said, um, by the way, uh, Great Neck concedes to Westport as the setting for the Great Gatsby. Uh, by the way, uh, she then moved to Connecticut. I don't know if the two are related, okay? Um, and I'm looking at my dog, Daisy. You're staying here. You're not, you're not going outside. Okay, yeah, I've got two dogs named Daisy and Zelda. Yes, I'm that insane. So um, what she did though, was this theory went against the main Fitzgerald biographer who's fabulous named Matthew Bruckley because he thought it was all about Great Neck and he squashed it. He squashed it and it lay idle and dead until I picked it up and just started doing presentations to schools and universities uh, with PowerPoints and out of that PowerPoint came the film. Um, all right, we're gonna spend some time in this photo. Uh, this is the 175 acre estate of Effie Lewis. And while you take a look at that photo, it's perfect. I gotta let Daisy out because I think she's hungry. I'll be right back, promise. Okay, how do you get aerial shots of your entire estate in 1920? So this is the summer of 1920 when Scott and Zeller there. Well, you just have the US Navy stop and park its blimp over your property because you have such pull with the US Navy, which you're about to see uh, very, very soon. So let me point out a couple of elements of this photo. Scott and Zelda lived up this path um, on the corner of a mystery millionaire's estate. Okay, that's in all the films, it's in Gatsby. And when I went to Great Neck, we went to Great, my film partner and I, we were stunned to find out that they lived in the middle of Great Neck, a couple, couple and a half miles away from the coast. It did not fit the geography of Gatsby whatsoever, but Westport did. Bottom right, you're gonna see this reflecting pool. We're gonna talk about that. You're gonna see this band shell. We're going to talk about that. They had, you had three beaches, 
just one of them's partially um, uh, visible. That's Cotton Zelda uh, swam at. Uh, this is the house. It's still completely intact today. It's just had some additions to it. It's now a very popular hotel and restaurant. And here is his massive boathouse complex and a tower and his private marina here. Okay, so I'll be going back to all of these elements. All right, there he is, F.E. Lewis. When I first started researching this man, um, seven years, oh man, it's now eight, well, wow, nine years ago, there was a single reference on a single sentence on the entire internet about him. Obviously, there's a lot more now um, because he was being investigated for his bank holdings. He wasn't guilty of anything, but he had a lot of money. How much money did he have? At the age of 21, he inherited $240 million uh, in today's money. As a matter of fact, that's a figure for, from a few years ago. So it's at least a quarter of a million dollars today. His great, great, great was a guy by the name of Moses Taylor. Yep, I'm sure you haven't heard of him. I had neither. What is he? After Alexander Hamilton, he's the major banker in New York City. And if you look him up online today, he's um, calculated as the 21st richest American in the entirety of American history. Now, what you're also going to notice, there he is at the helm of his many boats to the right, and he's wearing a cowboy hat, and that's significant too. All right, so... Hope I've set that up for you. There's the house today. I mean, uh, back in 1920. Um, you know, when you look at this and you think of the Gatsby movies, you're like, well, you know what? It's not a big French chateau with Norman turrets. Uh, and indeed, at one point of the novel, it's described as this sort of almost castle-like structure. But as Charles Scribner pointed out to me, he said, Deej, remember, in another part of the book, and it's at the end, uh, Nick Carraway describes it as a glorious ramshackle uh, sort of a house. Now, it's a beautiful house. It's a mansion, definitely by 1920 standards. But you know what? It's got a lot of little architectural styles and add-ons that pop up on. So, you know, at first glance, it doesn't really look like Gatsby's mansion. But at the same time, it totally is. Here's the aerial shot. Um, it is now the ninth most popular golf course uh, in Connecticut. And it's the number one wedding destination. Uh, in Connecticut, um, and uh, I lead very popular tours. We scheduled six last year and had to add six more. I do them as um, fundraisers for the Westport Historical Society. It's a four-mile glorious walk. Uh, everyone's provided with a um, picture book, and I'll take you through all these scenes that happened in the beautiful dam, the Great Gatsby. You'll see for yourself. Um, I mean, it's a slam dunk. By the way, the, the theory is proven. You're not watching a theory anymore. I was able to prove it. Now, at the top of this photo, all right, you're going to see these masts. These are sailboats. This is now the Saugatuck Yacht Club. There's three in Westport now. But this is the private marina of Barbara Probst Solomon's um, family. And just to let you know, uh, her estate, Great Marsh, extended from these masts all the way over to here. And it was called Great Marsh. Lawns sculpted by Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, uh, stunning view of the Fitzgerald uh, F.E. Lewis uh, place. And again, had the longest dock in the vicinity with a green light on it. Okay, Frederick E. Lewis put these in in 1917. It was uh, big news in the town because he put this massive wall around the front of his property. Now, these are large posts. Uh, large posts are also called posterns, straight out of Gatsby. It's one of the uh, popular stops on my tour. Um, Nick says in the novel, he says, in instead of taking a shortcut along the sound, and that's what Scott and Zelda did. They took a shortcut from the corner of F.E. Lewis's estate straight to his beach and his house. But as Nick said, instead of taking the shortcut by the sound, uh, we went down the road and went in by the great posterns. There they are. There they are. Uh, and it's a grand entrance to this day, straight out of Gatsby. Look at this party. Look, Gatsby, it is. It's the summer of 1920. Scott and Zelda, matter of fact, Zelda got kicked out of one of his parties for being too, too drunk, but he, he also thought she was pretty cute. So she was allowed back. Um, but here you see, you know, all these wonderful 20s parties goers, the men in the white duck pants. 
the dancers. And what I also love about this photo is that uh, right here, you see this full piece jazz band. And at one point, Nick Carraway describes the jazz band at Gatsby's party as no mean affair, but like full with all the instruments. And there you see it. So there's the Gatsby template if you ever saw one. Uh, here are a couple of his horses. He was a champion horseman as well, F.P. E. Lewis. I'll be showing you uh, that, but he had stables uh, all throughout the sculpted gardens of his massive estate. Um, so let's go back to the cowboy hat and why he's wearing one. Well, like Gatsby, he's from the West because not only did he own Longshore, named because it has a mile of oceanfront, uh, you know, waterfront, sorry, it's Long Island Sound, um, uh, so Longshore, uh, but he owned 8,000 acres in a place called Spadra, California, okay? Uh, 8,000 acres, so large that he had to build a halfway house. Uh, so when you traveled 4,000 acres, he preferred to have people do it by horse to make it more, you know, cool. Uh, you would spend the night at the halfway house and then go the other 4,000 acres. Um, champion hog breeder, doesn't sound too sexy, but he was. What was sexy was he developed um, livestock feeding techniques that are still in use today. So he wintered in Spadra, California, but what happened was he would brand his livestock with um, an iron that had a diamond over a bar and he called it Diamond Bar Ranch. And that's now the entire city of Diamond Bar, California. Two famous alumni from there, Alexis Morgan, the soccer player, and in, uh, one of my favorite stories, the rapper Snoop Dogg. Now, there he is on the right. Now, he's on his champion Arabian, Musan, the horse that Buffalo Bill Cody called his favorite of all time and rode during all his Wild West shows. Now, what Lewis did, he was a champion horseman. We're going to get back to a really cool story about him riding a horse a little bit later. But um, he brought in a very unpopular breed by, um, at the time. It was called the Arabian. If you look at a, at a picture of an Arabian today, it, you know, if you want to have fun and look it up, very different horse, very different face and head. They weren't popular, but he was one of the first two to bring them into the country. And then he singularly, along with this other uh, separate breeder, uh, made it one uh, popular breed uh, in America. Um, now, I showed you the tower, the boathouse complex is on the right. I'm gonna get to that in the next slide. I wanna talk about the tower. Famously in Gatsby, Nick Carraway says, uh, Gatsby's death, uh, guests, dove from the tower of his raft. Now it's on a raft, but what was indeed right in front of it were two giant rafts, floating platforms for his guests. And you could see that one of the three beaches right here, straight out of Gatsby, the tower. Now, this just gets better, trust me. <laughs> this is his boathouse complex, all right? In here, he would winterize his boats. These are spars where he would lift them into dry dock. Um, and uh, he was an, a, an amazing sailor. So we're going to get to the U.S. Navy now because that's his yacht in 1917 called the Kima. 55 sailors burned four tons of coal at sea a day. And in 2014 dollars cost a million and a half dollars just to maintain at the dock. Well, you'll notice there's U.S. Navy sailors there. What did he do? Well, I mean, literally he bought this thing. Uh, he kept it for a few months, and then he donated it to the U.S. Navy, uh, who used it in World War I to patrol against U-boats in Battery Park in New York City. And by the way, he said, you can keep it. And they did. Um, there he is with the cowboy hat. Back to that photo. Now you know why he's got the cowboy hat. That's him at the helm, and those are one of his boats uh, in Westport. And those are but just, what's well, about a, a third of all the boats he owned. Okay, so he had the yacht, then he had these, and then he had more steam launches. He also had um, two very powerful speedboats, which were called hydroplanes at that time. Aircraft engines, just immensely fast. That's important to our story too, because famously Gatsby says, a hey old sport to Nick Carraway, 
why don't we jump in um, uh, my hydroplane and take a spin around the sound? So in an audience of 1925, when they saw that, they'd be like, oh my God, this guy's got a speedboat. But Fitzgerald meant even more by that use of the term hydroplane, and uh, I'll show you in, in just a second. By the way, I also started to think, is this the guy who is the template for Dan Cody? If you remember in Gatsby, um, Dan Cody is where Jay Gats, before he calls himself Gatsby, um, he cruises on Dan Cody's yacht and he says, you know what, this is what I want. And it launches James, Jay Gats, James Gats to become Jay Gatsby. So, you know, not much of a hop, skip and a jump uh, to predicate that. Now look at this. This is one of his seven strangers uh, over time, okay? Uh, this one's out that day. He didn't have seven L at the same time, but he kept turning over boats. And you'll notice this one's out of LA. So it's, this is the one off his, uh, the coast of California. And in 1938, he took this on a deep sea cruise to Southeast Asia. It was uh, ostensibly a marine biology. He brought the first seals back to the um, San Francisco Zoo, for example. But what he was also doing in 1938 was he was covertly spying for the US government on Japanese naval and air installations in Southeast Asia. Um, the Americans knew something was gonna happen. And certainly three years later, the Japanese would attack America uh, in 1941 at Pearl Harbor. Okay, well, here's a plane, a hydro water plane, plane. It's a seaplane. Now, this is in 1917, um, and if you owned a plane, remember in 1917, the airplane's brand new. It's being used in warfare for the first time. To privately own an airplane, incredibly rare. To privately own a seaplane, unheard of, okay? So when Fitzgerald uses the term hydroplane, Keep in mind it had a double meaning for those in the know. Gatsby is 50,000 words. I recommend reading it every now and then. If you have like a beautiful long summer day, you, you, can, you can finish it. It's 50,000 perfect words. So like Mark Twain said, sorry for writing you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. To write a shorter book is much, much more difficult. So every sentence, almost every sentence literally has meaning, pregnant with meaning. So when Fitzgerald writes that uh, Gatsby has a hydroplane, you're, some of the audience thought, oh, cool, that's a you know, fast boat. Others would have been like, oh my God, he's got a seaplane. Fitzgerald meant that he had both. Um, you know, that's like, kind of like owning a Elon Rust, a Musk rocket these days. By the way, he leased his riverfront uh, foot, um, uh, shoreline to the US Army Air Corps. And indeed, they practiced takeoffs and landings during World War I uh, right off of his estate with his blessing. So that, again, here he is. That's with his first wife. By the way, he had four. The last one was the 18-year-old daughter of his college roommate. I thought that might have been an interesting story, but I, let's not go into that. But, um, but anyway, here he is at uh, being driven around one of his many cars. When I mean many, he had two of the most expensive cars in America, worth $160,000 uh, today. He had another one that was worth $250,000 uh, today. But lo and behold, I found out this guy was a serious competitive race car driver too. So horseman, yachtsman, and it was so much fun doing all this research. I just went down the rabbit hole. So in all these motoring magazines and newspaper clippings, from like 1907 to like 1915, he's racing all over the country. Um, never came in first, sorry to say, but he came in third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Uh, I love it. In like 1908, he lost to a car. The car that won was at going at a top speed of 40 miles an hour. <laughs> so, you know, such were cars back then, right? Um, another favorite story of mine was he attempted to go cross country in um 1917 that's unheard of he he got he bought a cadillac had it specially retrofitted put a bedroll in it because you know they weren't motels or anything they they would develop in the later 20s 
with the car culture, but uh, it broke down like 50 miles into the journey. Um, so he just got a private rail car, put it on the rail car and traveled his happy way out to uh, Diamond Bar, California. Okay, I am gonna give you a second to read these two headlines. Take a look at the bold print on the left. And I think the one on the right is gonna be self-explanatory. Okay, so this is from the uh, Westport Herald, um, and it is describing what is, in, I think, the greatest party in Connecticut history, and I think it's one of the great parties in American history, and I think you'll see why. So again, patriotic guy. It's a World War I fundraiser. It's an all-day party. Just to start off, okay, there were 800 cars there, 800 cars in 1917. I don't know how many they there were in the state of Connecticut, but it's probably half of them. Um, and also when I analyzed the list of the society people, the industrialists and bankers that were there, uh, I calculated, yeah, I'm that crazy. I calculated their collective worth as in the tens of billions of dollars today. All right, so what does he do? It's all day long. First of all, he gives people lifts uh, through multiple airplanes. Now keep in mind, this is 1917. Let's say you came over on the Mayflower, all right? So from uh, 16, uh, early 17th century until you, no generation of your family has flown until you had. Uh, right there, it's the event, it's a generational event in the entire history of your family and its ancestors. That's spectacular. Ina Claire is there. Who's she? She is really uh, the most famous actress in American history in many ways. She was the first to act naturally instead of sort of this declaratory Edwardian style. Uh, she was making $5,000 a week in 1920s money, um, which is staggering. And it was Fitzgerald's favorite actress. He had pictures of her all over his dorm room. And he wanted her to play Nicole in Tender is the Night in the 1934 film version. David Velasco, his ghost is said to haunt the Velasco Theater to this day. Who is David Velasco? Incredibly famous at the time. If you go see a play, if you go see a musical on Broadway, the entire stage design and the way it's done and the lighting and everything was the template was invented by David Velasco. John Philip Sousa, King of the March music, the great march, the great most popular music until jazz came, comes with his entire band, and not only that, performs a song that he uh, wrote specifically for the event. Houdini, not only was he pushed off the dock in his famous escape, um, escape uh, trick, but Lewis went one thing further. He had a giant crane on the property to drain uh, his marina and the channel out to Long Island Sound. So what he did was he put Houdini hung him from this crane and took him way out um, offshore and dropped him. And of course, Houdini comes out. Annette Kellerman created the sport of synchronized swimming. Was It created the most revolutionary until the bikini um, revolution in women's swimwear, the one piece. FYI, it was Zelda's favorite favorite swimwear to wear because it was body hugging. She liked that. Very good shape. She was an immense swimmer. And what she did, I love this. She loved to get tan. All right, she's one of the people along um, with Gerald and Sarah Murphy who create the, tr the trend of sunbathing. Remember before then it was considered, you know, for like the lower classes because they had to work outside. And what she did, and I love this about her, um, uh, was that she picked a this tan beige brown color that made her look nude. And she did that on purpose. Marceline the Clown is there. Yep, never heard of him? Well, watch this. The single most famous actor in the entire history of cinema, um, Charlie Chaplin, admitted freely. He said, I, I just copied Marceline the Clown. Marceline the Clown, 
in an era, he had his own comic strip written about him, very popular, full color. Uh, and in a, in, a, in a time when you do, um, you know, a one year residency, uh, like Celine Dion in Vegas or maybe Britney Spears, he did 10 years at the New York Hippodrome, which was the main thing. Uh, my two, and remember, there's a lot more going around. Uh, literally, the whole thing was like a three ring circus of entertainment. And literally, there was a three ring circus there. So what he did was, uh, believe it or not, um, animals were kept in McDougal Street in the city back then in the village. And they were rented out to Broadway plays and musicals and especially the Metropolitan Opera. But what he did was he had half of these circus animals shipped by barge out of New York City. They, they um, land on the shore of his estate. Um, they get off the ship. The other half he takes by private uh, rail cars um, and they're detrained and they are marched uh, through the streets of Westport. You can imagine, you know, everybody was excited about that. But the piece de resistance, back to the cowboy hat, all of a sudden, people hear the thunder of hooves. And everyone's looking around, where are they coming from? Where are they coming from? And over the crest of the hill comes a stagecoach being furiously driven by the drivers. And they're being furiously chased by Indians who are being furiously chased by cowboys uh, who rescue the stagecoach. Of course, who's in the lead? It's Effie Lewis uh, with a big white hat, the good guy. Here's the kicker. That's a real stagecoach from the American West in the 19th century that he shipped out from California. Those were real California cowboys. And in my favorite story, those were real Native Americans fresh off the frontier. Uh, I'll tell you right now, nobody in Westport, Connecticut had seen a real Native American uh, before this party. So the over-the-topness of this party, uh, I think nothing beats it. Okay. All right. I'll give you a second to read these. These are headlines from the summer of 1920 when Scott and Zelda were here. All right. Well, they say timing is everything, folks. And when Scott and Zelda arrive in Westport, it is perfectly timed. It's the first year of prohibition. They also land in a town that had no desire whatsoever to obey prohibition. They voted it down in a townwide meeting. Indeed, two states, this is interesting, Two states never ratified prohibition, Connecticut and Rhode Island, and um, the only two states. Reason being is that they had the largest per capita Italian-American population of any states in the union. And when I did the research on this, they still did today. And what's the point? You're not gonna take away the Sacramento wine. You are not gonna take away the tradition of growing your grapes and making your own wine. It ain't gonna happen. What's fun is that the police force uh, in Westport, numbering a grand total of four. Half of them were Italian, so they weren't going to do it. And I could say this because I'm Irish. The other half are Irish. Oh, my God. And look, it's St. Patrick's Day, right? I could tell you right now, there's no Irishman in Westport at that time that has any interest in enforcing, enforcing prohibition. So all the busts that were done in town were um, uh, done by the feds. Uh, the top right where it says 16 stills, I found another article, but it just, I couldn't get it to reproduce because it was really bad microfilm that said 60, six zero stills were found in, time, in town. Let me just point out a couple of these articles. Uh, the top one, the truck carrying $17,000 worth of booze held up in town. Uh, by the way, uh, notice it's on its way to Providence, right? Um, and it, uh, that's a quarter of a million today, guys, in a single truck, all right? So my favorite story, though, uh, there's so many, but this is one of them. Thousands of dollars, bottom left. You know, an alcohol, uh, a taxi turns over, alcohol bursts out of every scene. Later, they figured out why they only saw this 
um, taxi drive during the day. They never saw it at night. And why it always had to stop for gas in Westport. Well, there was there were no headlights in the headlights. It was full of booze. The wheel wells had booze. The fenders had booze. It was in the, uh, uh, the side panels and the seat panels, and half the gas tank had been uh, cut off and uh, was used to uh, store booze. So they didn't have a lot of gas, and they couldn't drive at night because the headlights didn't work. OK. On the right is an ad for the opening of the, um, an amazingly famous speakeasy, but spend some time reading the thing on the left. Okay, so not only do they come in this town that's just partying its tail off, they come into a town with the most famous speakeasy on the East Coast, the Miramar, run by Italians, of course, um, and the favorite speakeasy of George Raft, Jimmy Cagney, and Humphrey Bogart. Uh, by the way, it's a mile away from their house that they rented. Um, as you see, they're described as going there. I, I guarantee you they were half in the bag before they even got in the car, and Scott wrecks it. What's the tie to Gatsby? He loses a wheel in the famous accident, not where, you know, Myrtle gets killed, but in the famous accident scene, the first one uh, and one of two in the book, at one of Gatsby's parties, what does one of the guests do? Gets in an accident and loses a wheel. So Scott, like he said famously, all my characters are up Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, this is completely autobiographical and he puts it in the book. Okay, this is the other incredibly famous speakeasy. It's the Compa Wynn, it had this big hill um, that was tough to navigate. Uh, two eyewitness accounts of Zelda careening down this hill, straddling the hood of a taxi, hanging on to the hood ornament. One of those two descriptions has her as naked. Uh, you know, you can pick whatever one you want, uh, but certainly um, she did something risky. Now, the guy to the right, his name is Paul Jack Rose. He was so famous, he had a cocktail named after him called the, not surprisingly, the Paul Jack Rose. And who is he? Well, he controls the rum running operations in Westport. He's the brother-in-law of Jake Levy, uh, who owns uh, the Compo Inn. But he's incredibly important to the Gatsby story because I think he's the template for Meyer Wolfshine. And it's not hard to see why. When you read Gatsby, Meyer Wolfshine talks about the murder of Rosie Rosenthal at the Metropole. Well, Rose was involved in that murder. He turned state's evidence against the guy who orchestrated the murder, a guy by the name of Becker, um, who was electrocuted at Sing Sing um, for his crime. But he's directly linked to what Wolfsheim was talking about, was a, a famous run runner, controlled the operations in Westport. Uh, and by the way, he was from an old farming family uh, right next door in Norwalk. Okay, take a second to read these headlines. All right, so they're in a wild west town. As Barbara Probst Solomon said, it was as if it was a wild west town uh, just settled on the East Coast. Um, some real risky, fun, you know, fun behavior. And indeed, um, uh, Edmund Wilson, the great, great, great theater critic um, and literary critic, moreover, uh, one of Scott's friends at Princeton said that famously, Scott and Zelda were engaged in the nude orgies of Westport, quote, unquote. So um, real quick, and we're getting towards the end, uh, this is just the sale of Longshore in 1925. Uh, it's in Country Life, point about that. It's a very exclusive magazine. 
and it's just selling the fact that it has gardens, pools, vacuum heat, six bathrooms, brass piping, fireproof stables. Um, and uh, again, it was a desirable house. Um, this is our film. Uh, it's available. Amazon took it off because Amazon just did kind of a nasty thing. They took off all independent documentaries. We have no idea why, um, but it was incredibly popular. But you can get it on iTunes and Mountain Hulu and other platforms. Um, and I'm going to be showing you a clip from that uh, very shortly. Uh, the New Yorker published what they thought was the 36 uh, best films in America. And that's all films that were made in America in 2020. And we came in at number 30. So uh, easy to remember, right? Think of Gatsby in Connecticut. Shameless plug. Um, by the way, the reason I'm also ending with this is that that's them in front of the, where they had spent their honeymoon, but it's four years later. Keep in mind their honeymoon is in the uh, summer of 1920, but they come back for a photo op for the cruise of the Rolling Junk. So they're back in Westport a scant year before Gatsby uh, is published. So what I like to think is that Scott reorients himself to the geography of Westport. And again, another reason why it shows up in the novel. I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna go to a video clip. I gotta play with this a little while because let me make sure it's share sound. Okay, who are you about to see? You are gonna see uh, Sam Waterston in it. You might know him from Law and Order, but he was also the 1974 uh, Nick Carraway. You're gonna see Bobby Lanhan, uh, one of the Fitzgerald grandchildren and the only one who talks to the media, okay? Uh, and I just think you're gonna really enjoy this uh, clip. Who was Jay Gatsby modeled on? I find it interesting that so many people are digging into who were the sources for Gatsby. There have been some specific names proposed, and then there have been other theories, so we may never know. I heard he was in oil from a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Texas. I knew somebody who grew up with him in St. Paul. Well, you look at him sometimes when he doesn't know anyone's looking at him. You can see it in his eyes. I bet he did kill a man. Which one is he? Yes, there is something that ultimately about Gatsby that we never quite know. You're not supposed to be able to grasp it. Right, yeah. his essence, yeah. yeah. But I don't think there's any, any one person who served as a model for Gatsby. He took his experience, of course, as you're saying, it all comes from your own experience. But he blends different times of his life, different people he knew with himself and creates composites. In fact, Hemingway wrote him a famous letter criticizing him for that. You, you should base one character on one person, like I do. Like really? Like Hemingway does, yeah. You could have the ambition and the pretense that you would be able to see so thoroughly Thorough. into right. another person's character that no part of you right. would show up in the description. And I'm Fitzgerald, not sure I believe No, that. I don't either. And I think Fitzgerald wrote him back and rejected. It all converges on Gatsby, and Gatsby is inexhaustible. All those people who claim to have a piece of Scott's um, original raw material in their community, they, may, they might have a partial truth. Everyone's colored by their own prejudice and where they grew up. So when we interview people from Long Island, they're all convinced Gatsby's from Long Island. The danger of writing a book about Gatsby is that you then hear from all these people all over the world who've got the key. We're not supposed to read Gatsby and think Westport. That wasn't Fitzgerald's intention. He wanted us to read Gatsby and think Long Island. But since he didn't have those experiences on Long Island, since they came out of his magic year of 1920 on Westport, where he had a beach, he had a cottage next to a mysterious recluse, that's what he's using as his model. I think the interesting thing about all of these speculations and surmises and everything is that it's great if it enlivens the book. It's awful if it weighs it down. Mm -hmm. My father was on the scene when we started to lose our way during Gatsby's time, and he recorded it all. The generosity, the greed, the innocence, and the cynicism, the magnificence and the waste that was America between the two world wars. People read him now for clues and guidelines, as if by understanding him and his beautiful and damn period, they could see more clearly what's wrong. 
The thing that jumps out for me is she also puts in and his beautiful and damn period, uh -huh. which is I can you know, see uh, that puts it right in your movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, there it is. There's a quick clip from um, Gatsby in Connecticut. Night has fallen. Uh, and um, I hope my lighting is okay. It doesn't seem that right, but you can't see a double chin. So uh, everything's okay. Uh, real quick, thank you, Catherine. I do see a couple of chat questions. Um, oh, great. You've got the book and Alexandra Pearl thinks that's great. Thank you, Alexandra. And if anybody wants to, feel free to uh, unmute and uh, ask me any questions. Um, uh, very happy to. Well, that's what Zoom is doing to us right now, Catherine. I, you know, I think there's a new definition to Zoom out because people, <laughs> uh, yeah, right, people are Zoomed out. Um, but I do want to just leave on, on one note uh, that I think, I think, you know, you'll like. Remember those three things I told you about that were happening in, in 1920, the pandemic, race riots, a collapsed economy. Remember what happened just after that, folks, with all these brand new technologies, the car, the plane, the radio, uh, and all the new technologies we have today, revolutionary. What happened after all this it was called the Roaring Twenties. And I am darn near convinced, Catherine, that we are on the cusp of the Roaring 2020s. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so on that note, really, folks, I just wanna uh, thank Catherine again. Uh, this is a, it doesn't look like a lot of work because she worked hard doing it, but I know she's put in a long day and uh, really, really appreciate it, Catherine. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, sometimes I know when we ask for questions, it takes people a few seconds to sort of unmute and, um, and get their acts together. Does anybody have a question before we sign off? Just want to make sure we don't go off. I just have a quick question about Sam Waterston. Is he someone who like how come he's in the documentary does he have a personal was, interest okay so i was literally gonna just that was the last thing i was going to talk about so a friend of mine knows him and so gave me his phone number i call him he called me right back and he interviews me for about 42 minutes <laughs> um and you know that's something though he's giving you 42 minutes right um he is erudite and literate. He's as great an intellectual as he is an actor. He, by the way, he's from one of the oldest families in America, Boston Back Bay, total class act. So I said, hey, Sam, look, why don't you come down? I want to show you, you know, where you stayed in, uh, <laughs> in, the, great, in the Great Gatsby. And he said, look, Deej, I'll, I'll give you an hour. I'll give you an hour. I said, sure. So I sent a car up for him. We got him. Comes down. Five and a half hours later, he <laughs> leaves. So we took him, I took him to lunch at um, uh, the restaurant that was there now. And uh, it was just magical. And by the way, I am now planning, I mean, this is going to be, because we, we were going to do, because it was 2020, we we're going to do this, all this centennial stuff for Gatsby. But now it's going to go off the charts. I am planning what I hope to be the second biggest party in Connecticut history uh, at, at, at um, Longshore in Westport. Um, matter of fact, I think we're gonna be able to probably do it for two nights. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got a 1920s band, let me put it to you this way, with full dance, chorus, everything, where the master trumpeter and MC dresses as if he's in the 1920s, um, every day of his life oh my goodness so alexandra <laughs> uh ali to everybody what are the details on this party um actually <laughs> tomorrow morning we begin the first planning stages of it so i can't give you a date uh but what you can do is just google um you know richard webb gatsby i'll pop up and the story will pop up um or gatsby in connecticut and you can follow, I, I would assume, because everyone's going to be immunized by, um, let's just say most people by midsummer, but uh, by the fall, uh, I, I know we can do it. So um, keep your eye on that. So Catherine, 
thanks a million. Now, now go eat some dinner, have a glass <laughs> of wine, um, and good luck tomorrow with what you're doing. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.